flargle gargle. Thank you. Thank you for that. You gotta love a captive audience. The sound should be on now. Thank you. Yes, I turned it off before so you <laughs> wouldn't hear the sounds my stomach was making. No. Um, Pain Tab, Matias, and Ryan, thank you so much for that. We'll just pretend like the first half I was intentionally not saying anything. In any case, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine. Thank you so much for joining me here on the Adobe Creative Cloud YouTube channel. And for the next hour or so, we will be talking about new features that just arrived to the latest version of Adobe Audition CC 2018. And uh, a couple cool things I'm going to show you here, a couple of uh, existing workflows as well. But um, it kind of speaks to this whole theme that we had for this release, which was powerful alone, unstoppable together, which sounds very marketing-like, and it is, but it's actually very true because across all the apps in our video, uh, all of our video audio apps, including Premiere, After Effects, Character Animator, Audition, Adobe Meeting, Coder, Prelude. Uh, we've done a lot to really bring more and more sort of cross-product functionality into the applications. And the first thing I'm actually going to start with in Audition is showing you a new workflow to directly bring your content in from Premiere Pro without even having to have Premiere Pro launched. So um, as always, we've got our live interactive chat. And because we've got an hour today, I'll kind of pop back and forth here. It won't be the standard Facebook stream. Um, I'll try and uh, go back as much as I can. EHS Media, what's up? Yes, and I've got one more live stream today too. <laughs> Three times you're going to get to see me today. It's probably too much. But uh, yes, I'll be returning in about two hours on the Premiere Pro Facebook page to talk about the new color match and color workflows. So um, yeah, right, Ryan. It was ironic that it was the audition stream and I had no audio. That was, uh, that was part of the joke. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> Gabriel from Sweden, how are you? Juan de la Cruz Escalante from Bolivia. Very nice to have you join me. All right, so as I said, uh, live interactive chat, and uh, why don't we go ahead and just get started here, and we'll go into Audition CC 2018 and talk about one of the first new features um, that got added. And by the way, if you have other Audition questions while we're in this hour broadcast, uh, don't hesitate. Like I said, I'll be checking back here frequently so I can see your questions and comments. Just making them a little bigger over here. Yeah, the color match is amazing, Ryan. And it's, you know, it's one of those things. It's funny. I've, I've seen some people uh, after the NAB um, demo say, you know, I tried it and that's BS. I mean, it's machine learning. So, yeah, sure, it's not necessarily always going to be 100% there. Um, but it really does get you most of the way there most of the time. And, you know, there's best practices that can be implemented to make the match result uh, the sensei result even better. Part of that is just, you know, properly exposed, properly sort of flattened out footage, or even if it's mildly graded or with a LUT, just again, sort of balanced and white balanced to some degree. Uh, I was testing it with a bunch of files that were just really horribly shot, bad exposure, bad color, bad, you know, no white balancing at all. And, um, it, some of them it amazed me. It, it just nailed it right away and it was perfect. And some it was close but a bit off because the original content hadn't been treated in any way. So, you know, just using uh, color wheels wasn't quite enough. And once I pre treated it and re white balanced and did a few tweaks, then it really nailed the matching against even a, a reference frame or a still frame. So, uh, Just Incredible Studios, hello. Isaac X from Australia, nice to see you. SAS Front, nice to see you as well. Okay. So here we are in Audition, and we're going to start by, I mentioned, talking about bringing in um, Premiere Pro projects. Now, for some time, people have been wanting to, um, or I should say, for some time, you've been able to leverage dynamic link between Premiere and Audition, where if you were starting uh, a session, uh, starting an edit in Premiere, and then you wanted to do your audio post in Audition, you have the uh, you know send sequence to Audition functionality. And this was great, and it still is great. And the idea there being that... Uh, uh, you could take the entire timeline um, with any video that's in that timeline and dynamically stream all the video into a new audition session. And then it would basically create copies of all the audio and send that over non-destructively to audition to do your audio post. And once you were in audition, 
as of the last year and a half or so, because we integrated Adobe Media Encoder, you had a complete sort of finishing solution by being able to go directly to Adobe Media Encoder, as opposed to sending it back to Premiere, which you used to have to do in previous versions. But the one request we kept hearing was, um, it would really be nice if, you know, if you're talking about finishing, audio finishing, how about I just open the Premiere project in Audition rather than having to go through a Premiere send to process. It's just more time and it's one more step and it's one more app that has to be running and, you know, it's not sort of the cleanest experience as functional as it was. So that's what we did. So here, if you look in the media browser, you'll see that I've got a Premiere Pro project and uh, I can simply just drag this into our editor here. Actually, is this gonna try and open? I realize I have a session open right now. I wonder if that's gonna try and open in this session. Well, let's find out. <laughs> We're gonna see what's gonna happen right now. But as you can see, I can just drag it right into, into Audition now. And just like when you open dynamic links, it says, oh, what sequence do you want? So I want this trailer export. Open that. Now I left a file unlinked. That's my user error. So let me go ahead and just relink that. And it's looking for a video file. And uh, it's right here, the top, yep, master, all right. Click open on that, click OK. And what happened? There we go. It opened it in a separate sequence, which is what I would have hoped it would have done. And there it is, okay? And what you can now see is that we've got our video over here. We've got our dialogue music. This was basically a cut down of the, um, the trailer from this film, The Scene Between by Brian Rawless. And uh, if we play this back. Documentaries have always had is society and the wild. And... Okay. There's our video uh, and our nice video monitor here. It's also worth pointing out that um, as of the October update to Audition, you know, so you've got time code in there, time code overlay. Um, you've got a whole series of new time code preferences, including if you're using Audition, again, in terms of like ADR or Foley or sound design workflows. If you are referencing either session time code from the Premiere project or perhaps the actual media time code, it'll do both. Uh, you've got some choices on where the time code is positioned, of course. Uh, opacity of the little background bar, the size of the time code. I like to keep mine pretty small. I didn't realize that was zero. Yeah, I like it kind of tiny. Again, if you're doing ADR, you might want it a little bigger if you're referencing specific cues. Um, it's just flexible and easy. Of course, you've got the ability to send out uh, a secondary monitor with a full screen via HDMI here. Um, and one of the newer things, which we're gonna talk about in a couple minutes with regard to sound design in particular, is this new um, clip spotting function. So you can really more accurately align sound effects to a specific frame in a video, just you just have some more visual indicators of where the sound is happening against the actual cut or the frame. So it just makes it a lot easier. All right, so bringing the audition, uh, bringing the Premiere Pro projects directly into Premiere is <clears throat> such a nice new addition because again, you don't have to have Premiere running anymore. Um, whatever content is in Premiere, whether it's this, this edit was a combination of 4K and 8K, all of that will play back in here exactly as it did in Premiere Pro. You've got the same uh, fractional playback options as well. Uh, you can do, you know, obviously different types of scaling here in the monitor. <clears throat> I resize this all the time, and I only work with one monitor. But typically, if I, were ha if I had second, a secondary monitor, I'd probably put this and some other elements over there as well, just to make it a little bit easier. Um, so, yeah, really, really cool stuff. Hey, what's up, Bake Like a Pro? What is up, Ant Pruitt? Sweet, dude. Yeah, I'm going to be talking about that auto-ducking because, of course, it began here. So I'm going to show that here, too, and thanks for reminding me to do that. Uh, Isaac, you were just asking, and, and Just Incredible Studios asked, are there digital instruments available in Audition? No. No. I wish there were. Uh, I've been asking for this, and please, you know, if you go to uh, directly from adobe.com when you sign in, there's a, there's a link for, like, feature requests. I got to see if I can find the URL and I'll post it here. Um, in fact, I'm going to do that right now while I'm talking about this. I've been asking for this for a long time, but I alone am not enough. <laughs> so if you want to see MIDI and instruments and things in there, um, you got you got to submit a feature request. Hold on. Let me see. Ah, here it is. Wish form. There we go. All right. That's what I want. I'm gonna copy this. I'm going to paste this in the chat for you. Because this is where you can request features. And by the way, you might think, oh, well, that's 
that's great, but no one ever reads those things or whatever. No, 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 no. This is how um, this is how features happen these days. You know, uh, anyone who knows. I mean, this is why we stream every week. Why we're so accessible. Uh, this is how we solicit feedback as how to get get things in the product that you want. So I would love to have that, and uh, I really really wish it were in there now. Uh, Isaac, again, let's see. Can you separate different instruments from an audio file in Audition? E.g., you have a song. Can you separate the instruments or sounds in the song? So Isaac, the short answer to that is um, you can do some of that via our center channel extractor. Now, I wasn't planning on showing that today. You can go to my YouTube channel. Uh, I will type the URL in here as well, which is youtube.com slash Jason Levine video. And you can watch uh, a tutorial that I made on there, which leverages our center channel extractor, which is basically it's, it's based around um, removing vocals and or isolating vocals to create things like acapellas. Um, now this can work in other ways. This can also work to allow you to do certain things like extract bass and some other things. Um, there's also uh, something which maybe I can show you today called the frequency band splitter, which allows you to separate um, specific frequency bands out of a mixed track. But what, if you're actually looking to extract you know, a guitar part from a mixed file or you know, a discrete bass line or a discrete uh, you know, keyboard line, no, we don't have that natively. However, you do have other softwares like Melodyne, um, and there's a few other plugins that do that sort of stem extraction from a mixed song, and they're pretty impressive, you know. Uh, but we don't we don't do that natively, um, unfortunately. But they've already kind of done it, and it's pretty sweet. Um, EHS, remix feature brought into Premiere, pretty pleased. Yeah, I know. That's, uh, I'll tell you, after bringing auto ducking in, we've heard so much from people, from customers. When are we going to get auto duck? I'm sorry, remix in Premiere. Um, I don't have an ETA for you, but I know, I know they've heard you and I know they want it to. Hey, what's up, Cedric? Nice to see you. Sweet. Okay, William is asking how to make voiceover. BBC Radio. Again, uh, so you can check out my, my YouTube channel. I just posted the link. There's a whole series on there called Audio 101, where I talk about how to record your voice, how to create a podcast. I've got a whole bunch of different videos. So there's an Audio 101 series. There's also a few separate tutorials on podcast audio. Um, this is something I've been doing personally for a very long time, <laughs> earning all of my gray. So um, check those out. There's a lot of great info and detail there. All right. Sweet. Okay. So Opening Premiere Pro projects and Audition, first primary new feature. Let's talk about some of the ways and things that we've done in here to make actually mixing and working with sound and sound design for video easier. So I'm going to take another session that we have here. I'm going to open this one up, Let's see if it's in my list already. Yeah, here we go. Got a couple of sessions, and I'll show you a few examples of this. Um, so this is, again, from the same film, the scene between, and... Uh, in this case, what uh, what we want to do is it's it's got this is all of the sound design, dialogue, uh, ambience, sound effects, and music. So these are all of the sound elements that were actually cut against the video in Audition um, for this particular project. Now, a couple of quick things. So first of all, this session has a lot of tracks. You know, not a crazy amount. I typically will have way more than this in an average music only session. But it's enough to the point where, you know, traditionally, if I were uh, wanting to access, okay, where is the, uh, where are the wave sound effects? I've got water and waves. This is like an ocean. It's about the ocean and stuff. Um, I see one there, but there's some down here. Oh, no, there's water. And then down below, okay, there's there are bubbles and things. So you wind up doing a lot of scrolling around. And often what I would do is I would shrink or minimize the tracks, which, by the way, if you didn't know, you can do that. Um, the little waveform button in the upper left-hand corner of each of the tracks themselves, if you just click on it, it minimizes. So you, you know, it, it only reveals sort of the mute solo record uh, input monitor buttons. You can still see the tracks. They're basically shrunken. They're, they're as, that's as small of a vertical height as you can have in the track um, in lieu of just deleting it entirely. But it didn't really hide it. And, you know, especially if you're like me and you're sort of working on individual tracks here, so you're making things bigger and then you're scrolling around and then maybe you're doing a global scroll. So again, I'm using the mouse gesture here. You can see as I, well, that looks perverse, but uh, I'm just gesturing and it's adjusting vertical height. By the way, that works the same if I go up to this horizontal uh, scroll. 
Same thing there. By the way, watch with a single zhuzh of my finger here. Wait. <laughs> zzz, zzz, zzz. Oh, wait, that was more. That was not a single zhuzh of my finger. <laughs> it's hard to do on camera, friends. Sorry. Um, what I was trying to get at was is that it's super fast and accurate to zoom in here vertically or horizontally um, in the multi-track with gestures. But one of the issues was if you wanted to bring everything into view, it wasn't quite so easy. And we had this button down here called Zoom Out Full that attempted to zoom out all of the tracks and show you the full length and the full uh, track height of everything. It just it didn't always do exactly what you expected. So we've now revamped this function. So now when I click Zoom Out Full, what you'll see is that it brings all of the tracks into view, um, or as many as it can fit based on your resolution, of course. There, there, there are some limits. Um, but everything will be even in view. And more importantly, it shows the entire duration. This was the biggest thing that was kind of annoying before was that you'd zoom out, you'd see everything and think, oh, okay. And then you'd go to do something and only realize that, oh yeah, it, you know, it scrolls 10 minutes past this. So this new function here, it seems simple. It's really useful. And no matter what you are, what state you're in, how you've been adjusting, working with things. Again, you might have uh, you know, automation lanes twirled down, so you're doing fader automation, all this kind of stuff. You click on that zoom out full, and there it is, and it just brings everything back into view. So yeah, this is uh, really, really nice, all right? Super cool. Yeah, Cedric. No, I know. Exactly. And it was it, it was not it just what it just didn't work as designed. So it works great now. Um, it's really, really wonderfully done. And you're going to find, by the way, that as you um, move through sessions and as you page through sessions or if you do, if you leverage scrolling, the whole UI is just a lot faster and a lot leaner and cleaner. And it boils it down into, OK, what's the most important thing you can do right now? This is really smooth. But Mavericks is a way that's so dangerous, you really got to work that out. And by the way, um, I'm at full res here, so this is playing back. Um, I think this edit is a 4K one. So again, um, it just it just plays wonderfully. It's using the same engine that Premiere is using for playback. So performance-wise, the latest version of the app is just a lot leaner and cleaner. Now, now that we got all of our tracks in view, that's great, but ultimately, we're still left with the, okay, I only want to work on dialogue or, you know, typically I'll do dialogue first and then maybe I'll work on some of the Foley or sound design and then maybe some of the ambient stuff and then the music. And when I'm doing that, um, I don't necessarily need to see everything. So another thing that I would often do, um, which by the way, still to this day, it doesn't always do it as, as designed for me. So, you know, you can move tracks around. You can see as I'm sliding this up, I can, I can actually move these tracks and replace them. But even that gets very confusing and it's a pain and it's not the most ideal workflow. So to combat that, we took a, a step, took a step from After Effects, again, powerful alone, unstoppable together, and added a brand new panel called the Tracks Panel, which is down here. Tracks, not the track panner, but the tracks panel. <laughs> I didn't realize how close those were. So uh, I'm gonna dock this actually along the side here. Let's shrink this up. Now, if you haven't seen this already, obviously you can probably guess what it is just based on the fact that it has little eyeballs here. So this is now showing us all of the tracks in view. And what we have the ability to do is disable tracks that we don't want to see. It can still play them back in the background unless you mute them. They are still in the session. They're just taken out of view, much like in After Effects where you have your solo and hide uh, button. Same concept here, just to pull things out of the view, just to keep it cleaner, leaner, and easier to work. So if I were to work on dialogue, let's say, I'm gonna zoom back out here, um, and I don't wanna hear music or sound effects right now. So I'm gonna mute those tracks, but I also don't need to see any of that. So I'm gonna turn off everything that isn't dialogue. So helicopter, waves, I'll leave breathing because that's kind of related to dialogue. Water, thunder, bubbles, rumble, music. I'll leave the dialogue uh, submix here. I'll turn off sound effects and I'll turn off music. Now when I zoom out, and by the way, I'll do our zoom out full again, what do we see? Now we only see dialogue, right? So great. Here's what's even cooler about this, is that you also have the ability now to save these as presets. So let's say all of my dialogue I wanna to save to preset one, which is also assigned a keyboard shortcut. Let's go ahead and do that, all right? Now, you'll notice that there's also some presets in there, so show all tracks. So let's turn everything back on. 
Now for this, let's say I want to do a, uh, just a sound design mix, okay? So I'll turn off dialogue and music. By the way, this is just the way I'm working. You don't have to mute anything. I'm just showing you because we'll be able to play these back in a second. So I'm going to mute dialogue and music. And now I'm going to turn off music. I'm going to turn off dialogue. Music, we'll keep the rumble, bubbles. That's all good. Uh, everything, okay, no, we don't want the breathing. And we'll turn off all the dialogue tracks. And now you can see it's just sound design. So once again, I'll come up to here, track visibility, save. And I'll put that into preset two. And uh, you know, you've already got uh, a show all tracks um, option here, so I don't have to create a shortcut for that. But the idea now is here's our full session with everything. And I'll turn this stuff back on. Sometimes a wipeout of Mavericks can feel like a car wreck. All right. And if I want to work on just dialogue, let's go ahead and mute these. And I'm going to hit Shift 1, because that's my shortcut for the dialogue. And look, there it is, just the dialogue tracks. Sometimes a wipeout of Mavericks can feel like a car wreck. Getting ripped in a different direction, you're getting... That was a really bad edit right there. Okay, once again, I already forgot what the uh, shortcut was for show all. So I'll go ahead and unmute these, and let's mute the dialogue, and let's just work on the sound design. So that would be shift two. And here's our sound design mix. So again, everything is still there, everything is still in view. And by the way, if we wanted to suddenly reveal anything that was left out, notice I can just turn it on or enable or disable it right from the panel here. So even though it's not in the preset, it's still accessible. So I can say, okay, I need to hear the music. Let's just hide it again though. I don't wanna see it and I don't wanna see dialogue. So now we've got music and sound design. Sorry about that. You can see they mix this a little hot. And um, if anyone's just wearing headphones, a nice big explosion hitting zero dB. So I apologize. Um, all right. Just going over to the chat here for a second. Okay. Oh, nice. Just incredible. You did the request. Nice. Nice, nice. And Isaac, you'll do it too. So, um, yes. So, tracks panel, filtering, just like Photoshop, just like, sorry, just like After Effects so useful and all of this in an effort to again just make the process um, of working inside the multi-track editor that much easier by the way it's also worth pointing out here notice i switched to the mixer view it applies to the mixer view as well so here's our you know here's our sound design mix shift f uh shift two um here's our dialogue mix shift one and gosh what is it people ask me all the time you don't use shortcuts i i can't retain is that command shift a is that what that is I don't even know what these, what are these symbols? Option, God. option shift A, option shift A is everything. There we go, okay. <laughs> I'll forget that five minutes from now. So option shift A for everything, shift one for dialogue, shift two for sound design, option shift A for everything. Oh, look at me, look at me, evolving, learning. Okay, so, so darn useful. Now. Since we just happen to be in the mixer view, uh, it's worth pointing out. Um, and actually, I don't even think, I don't have it on. Do we have automation in this mix? I don't know that it really matters, but uh, it's worth pointing out since we're here um, in terms of control surfaces. Now, this is not new, but I did want to point out <clears throat> that you have the ability to add control surface support uh, or to work with control surfaces in Audition. You can see I've already got Huey uh, selected as a device class. That's the current one that I've already added to, uh, to the uh, preferences panel here. Huey being for human user interface is the most common. Pretty much any uh, digital mixer out there that does um, you know, connectivity for automation via USB or whatever, or MIDI, supports the Huey protocol. If not, the second standard, which almost every one that I've ever seen does, is the Mackie protocol. This one is the one we've had the longest. Also, if you're coming from an Avid environment or Pro Tools and you've got a Yukon board, we support the Yukon protocol and um, all of the mapping for the Yukon devices. And of course, all of that is fully editable. We've also got native support for the PreSonus fader port, which um, I don't have my secondary camera on here, but I've got one right here. 
Uh, I've shown that on stream before. What's nice about the Fader Port 8 from PreSonus is that it has motorized faders. So it's more of a it's more of a gimmick for the client. But you know, if you do a mix and you you know you want to show people that things are automating and moving in real time, it's very nice that it has that functionality. It's also worth pointing out that Premiere Pro has control surface support as well. Now it doesn't have all of the options of Audition just yet. As you've seen, we kind of stagger some of these things in from time to time. But um, what's nice is if you go into an automation mode here, and by the way, all of these parameters are accessible on those devices themselves. So you go into a, a write mode and you do your fader automation. So here, let's just do it for, for, the, for giggles for right now. Um, what is this? This is, okay, it's super quiet. So I'm just, I'm just gonna automate this, uh, this helicopter sound and make this just a little bit louder here, all right? So let's go ahead and turn on, go into write mode. Take it out of solo, and I'm just going to ride this fader. Okay, what is it breathing? There's a weird breathing in there. Let's uh, let's see. What is that? Is that oh, agitated, agitated male breathing. What is that? Sound design can be super creepy. Uh, in any case, if we look here at our helicopter and twirl down our automation lane, what you see is all the keyframes that it drew for the volume envelope. But if I go to the mixer and wind back here, and if you look at the fader, all right, and this is where I say, no hands. The fader is moving, so it's automating. And if I turned on my fader port right now, you would see the actual faders fly, as they referred to in the past, flying faders. So um, again, uh, that's been in there for a little while, but kind of nice and uh, very flexible. And again, um, you can do the same kinds of things in Premiere Pro as well uh, when you're doing your sound design. Okay, Option Shift A was everything. All right, so. Uh, let me talk to you a little bit about, again, something else that we've built upon for sound design, which is clip spotting. All right. What's up, Evil Cerise? Mini Audio 101. Haha. <laughs> yeah, this is just uh, some of the new features in the latest update to Audition, which I know you are now intimately aware of, having just come off of three days of Adobe Live, which, by the way, if anyone didn't catch uh, Adobe Live this past week, so we had some great, great artists on there, including good buddy of mine, Eric Addison. Uh, and uh, Mark Edward Lewis on the audition side. Eric Addison was doing Premiere from 100 Acre Films. Great dude. He's, he also runs the San Diego Premiere Pro user group down there. He's a director, filmmaker, um, super nice guy, super knowledgeable. Um, and of course, we had several other guests as well showing After Effects and Character Animator. You can find all the replays of that here on the Adobe Creative Cloud YouTube channel. Um, all right. Just incredible. You're very welcome. Thank you. Cool, cool. All right. All right, so uh, where was I? Oh yes, sound design. So we've added this new clip spotting feature. And what this is specifically for is just to, as I mentioned, allow you to give you more um, accuracy and flexibility when doing sound design and lining up specific sound effects to a moment in the video. Now Audition has lots of different ways to view your timeline. Um, you know, typically when I'm working in just straight audio, I leave it in decimal time because I, I don't, I don't need frames per second. I'm not working in frames. And of course, even when you're in frames per second, you're still, don't forget, it's an audio, it's a DAW, it's an audio editor. So you're always, you can always slip, slip and slide content in subframes, right? Um, you know, we're at 48K, that's 48,000 samples per second versus... 24 frames per second. It's a lot more granular placement for audio, which, you know, a lot of times that's exactly what you have to do when you're laying back sound to video. So, um, but I leave it at the appropriate SMPTE time code when I'm working against video because then I definitely want to line things up, you know, or I'm leveraging the cuts and frames to do just that. By the way, also worth pointing out here, this is where you have your, um, your snapping. So if you want to snap to frames um, to see where things are, and again, that's fine. You may find that you're going to have to place things in between frames anyway. You can enable that feature if you're in um, in a uh, uh, frames per second time display 
and it kind of makes that easier as well. But so here, uh, if we just take a look, let me see what we've got here. I'm gonna mute this too. Okay, so there's a cut right here. Where did that one come from? Like it's got this explosion right here. I'm gonna mute that. So we have this other explosion sound effect, which is here. And I want to line that up specifically to the cut, which, uh, again, if I zoom in here. Okay. Now, by the way, um, it's worth pointing out, too. I generally turn off... Uh, I generally turn off the audio scrub play audio while scrubbing here um, when doing sound design one because it doesn't it's not it's not like tape style scrubbing I don't know it's everyone's preference really it doesn't really necessarily do it for me again when you're laying stuff back to to video it's more important that you're paying attention to the cut and the frame so like here right here is where that needs to go so what happens now is when you zoom in if I grab the explosion, and that's exactly where it has to happen. So you can determine, remember, sometimes the sound design, it has to come a little bit before the cut for a slightly more dramatic feel. Depending on where you grab the clip now, when I do that, what you're gonna see is this blue line. See that dotted blue line that's following me? And this is now going to allow me to snap and align specifically to that frame for great accuracy. Now again, that's right on the frame cut right there. I might, I might wanna slip it back ever so slightly, but let's take a look at what that sounds like here. And we'll put it in context with everything else. Yeah. And that's what we would refer to in audio as like, right on the beat. It's right on the cut, but it works, right? And if you want to make it more dramatic, you know, this is where you could possibly add some ambient reverb or something like that. You can actually see this is being sent to um, the sound effects mix bus, which let's see what's on there. What do they have on there? Nothing. <laughs> There's nothing even on it. So, uh, you know, we could place like a reverb on here. Let's go into our studio reverb and I'll grab something like uh, a vocal reverb, which is going to simulate um, a plate, be a little bright and shimmery, uh, maybe more of a hall. We might want it sort of a bit more cavernous and dark. Um, I'll increase some early reflections here. Uh, we're going to leave it as a full wet signal, no dry. And let's just minimize this for a second and go into the mixer. I'm going to solo this rumble track here. Okay, so this is obviously being sent. Is this a direct? Let me see. I got to see how this is being routed there. Oh, so this is being directly routed via the output. So they didn't even use sends for this. Okay, so I wouldn't necessarily do it that way. Um, if you're going to be applying a reverb, so here, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to put this back to the master. Um, best practice for this, by the way. All right. So if you want to add ambience and reverb, I'm glad I actually looked at how they had done this. Um, Yes, you can send the output directly to a bus. Now that's useful if you're just kind of subgrouping a bunch of things together. The problem is, is that in terms of applying effects to that bus, now you're applying the same amount of an effect to everything at the same time. Now, you know, for like an explosion, I don't want to necessarily, I don't want to send too much. And also based on how I'm going to set this reverb, I also don't want to accentuate a lot of low frequency um, reverberation because that just doesn't sound good. That's what causes a lot of muddy, very um, uh, non uh, non discreet sounding bass that just kind of ruins a mix. So in lieu of sending it to the bus that way, I can actually use the track send, which you see here. Okay, and this is also where you have what's known as pre or post fader control. Now this is kind of essential for sound design um, because again for effects. In particular, I want to be able to control the dry, unaffected signal of the sound effect and have independent control of the wet, reverberant signal. So if I want that maintain complete control over dry and wet, I'm going to send it pre-fader, which is going to be the other 
state of this button. And you can see that the, the arrow is before the fader. Well, that's backwards. It's very hard to do this on stream like that. You see what that looks like, okay? So if you want complete control over the dry signal and the reverberant signal, and that's also why I put that effect at 100% wet. I don't want any of the dry signal present there. That's a reverb bus. That's an echoey bus. I want to be able to control that separately. That's what I can do here. So now I just choose which one I'm sending it to. Let's send that to the sound effects mix. And then you have the amount. This is your volume, the amount that you're sending over there. And then you even have a separate stereo pan for that. So if we were, I'm going to loop this. All right, let's just uh, take our time selection tool and we'll give it, we'll give it like till the end of the clip here. All right. And uh, let's go ahead and start increasing this now. We're, oh, I need to turn on loop playback. That would help. Loop it. And start increasing this. Now let me pull the dry signal down. Okay. Oh, how did that state get changed? Why is that post fader? There we go. So again, pre-fader, here's the dry. Now we're just hearing only the reverberated signal. And that's way too much. And maybe we only want it to echo towards the right. And here's where we can now retune what this sounds like. Maybe some more early reflection. Maybe we want it even wider. We're cutting off all frequencies below 300 hertz there, so none of that low-end rumble is going to come through. The I don't really want to dampen it, though, so let's pull this down. It's a little brighter. I do want it to diffuse. All right, and maybe we give it even more decay. And now let's bring up the direct signal. So you hear that now, how everything's kind of filtering in there and you're getting this very kind of neat stereo with this Now, as I mentioned before, because all of the sound effects are filtered through this bus via their output, they are now all going through that reverb. So that's not gonna work because if I turn everything else back on, everything's gonna get very echoey right now if we uh, were to take a listen to this. I mean, it's not so bad, but you've kind of lost some of the sound design because again, now everything is being affected at 100% wet. So you're not hearing the direct signal of the helicopter or the waves or the thunder or the water or the bubbles. So uh, again, if you're wanting to subgroup things solely to have them on a fader, nothing wrong with sending it from the output. That's what this is here, by the way, for anyone who's not really taken note of that before. This is your output here. This is your input. So we're sending the output instead of to the master, we're sending it to a specific bus. That's useful if you're wanting to subgroup things on a single fader and then apply a global effect, maybe something like compression, right? If I'm uh, taking a drum kit and I wanna take all the pieces and globally send them to a stereo bus so everything's on one fader and I want to apply a global compression to that, which is pretty common, you've already separately compressed the kick drum, the snare drum, the hi-hat, whatever, then I might do it this way. But otherwise, if I'm sending something over to reverb or whatever, uh, I, I wouldn't. So I would take all of these out of there. But you get the idea. And you have some really nice control there. So that's a little bit on sort of clip spotting. Now, I just wanted to show you one more example of where I just tested that out for real. So uh, uh, my, uh, my, one of my offspring is a, is a gamer, and he wanted to um, create a little title sequence intro for his channel. So um, I told him, hey, the best way to do that, of course, is via motion graphics templates in Adobe Stock into Premiere. So he did just that. He found a template that he liked. He modified the text, the color, and some of the elements, and then exported a video. And when he did the video, uh, here, I'm just going to mute this for a second. Um, the video looked like this. So here it is. And this might be a template that many of you have already seen. All right. Looking over here. 
Okay. So that's that's what it was. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you, Evil Cerise. Nice. Okay, hold on, I'm reading. Travis, yes, it would be great if Premiere could import an audition SESX file. Yes, so as you would expect, we introduced bringing PR, PROJs into audition. I heard that a bunch of times on the floor at NAB. So the engineers have heard you. Um, again, I can't tell you an ETA, but it's on, it's on the list. And that's the next logical extension, right? For the same reasons, maybe my sound mix is locked down um, and ready to go, and I don't need to go into audition, but I'd like to bring all the session elements with everything into Premiere, much like opening the project, you would expect that we can do that. So I can't say it's coming and when, but it's on the list, and they're, they, they're listening. Very cool. All right. A raccoon, yes. Nawardine Salomon, yes. Okay. Cool, cool. All right. So, and uh, Aza Ali, hello, how are you? All right, so naturally I said, son, um, you need some sound design on this because without something, it's boring. So, if, you know, first he grabbed some music, some royalty-free music, and it was okay. It just didn't have the punch. I said, what it needs is that it needs, you know, you got you to add some sound design. That's really what does it. So we started just with some actual music that was from my Loopology libraries, which, by the way, are available to all of you. Um, as well as uh, a whole series of sound effects and other things, and I can put up a link for that in a moment. So here was just some of the, uh, the music that I, or that he added to this, again, based on my library. And it's kind of more ambient, it's not really melodic or anything. Okay, and if you listen there, you can see we've got a delay bus going on down here. And again, if I were to twirl these things down, well, you see I use the track resize all the time and go into the sends, you can see that both this base ARP file has, uh, it's sending, now this is post fader in this case, um, which means that the fader and the effect are controlled together, right? When it's post fader, if you move that, that volume control on the base ARP track, the effect goes with it. So that's, that's the, the desired effect of a post fader control is that they work in tandem. So the delay is always tied to the ARP delay, the base ARP, okay? It's always together. Whereas when it's pre-fader, the fader here, this volume control remains just dry signal, and then you have the affected signal over there. So this one is, is post-fader, and then this um, resonant D thing that's pre-fader also being sent to the delay bus, all right? So just real simple, and again, that allows those delays to echo. even after the file has stopped playing, all right? So that was kind of the first thing, but I said, what this needs, of course, is it needs those explosions. It needs those <laughs> So how do you simulate that? Well, again, I dipped into our um, Adobe Audition Loopology library, which I can show you here, and I'll post a link in just in a second. Now, again, you have access to all of these. It's tens of thousands of sound effects and royalty-free loops and music beds created by yours truly in more than 30 different styles. Um, so on the loopology side, here's all the various styles of loops that you have available to you. Ambient, blues, classical, orchestral, country disco, one shots for drums, all again recorded by me in my studio a couple, well, quite some years ago, but fantastic drums, beautiful microphones, a lot of classic drums in there too. 1970 Ludwig Pearl, um, which is Ringo's kit, should have saved that one. Uh, funk and rock, industrial, lounge, Latin, noise, house, reggae, ska, rumba, rockabilly, techno, dance, urban R&B, wedding and event, world and international. And of course, there's like sub styles and all of those. So lots of different styles there. And then you've got uh, some sessions and then you've also got sound effects, which includes ambience, animals, cartoons, fire, explosions, foley, foley footsteps, um, horror, human elements, all these different things. I mean, there's, there's great stuff in here. Um, and that's what all of this is here. So the first thing was you got to get that like explosion sound effect happening. And there's a couple of things because you've got the text flying in. So, you know, this is where you have to think creatively. Like, what does that sound like? You know, to me, that was like some kind of, it, it was, it was a, 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 an explosion, but almost like a reversed explosion. So what you can see here is that I actually took this sound effect of a fireball. Oh, let me solo that down here. Oh, by the way, we're hearing the bus re uh, bus delay. So we turn that off. Back to here. OK, 
Okay. So that's just the sound of a fireball that was this reversed. And that kind of feels like that text is flying on the screen. I mean, what does text sound like flying in front of you? You can make it sound like whatever you want. Now, here's an example where if I wanted to keep just a local effect um, right onto our effects inserts, I could have added a little bit of reverb or decay or something on there. And I'm just going to talk about some of the native effects here. But this is another great example where, yeah, you know, I, uh, I don't want it too echoey because then you're going to lose some of the punch, but maybe a little bit of ambience. So I happen to like this one, um, which is a preset I made 100 years ago. Room Ambience 2, you have access to it as well. Uh, again, if you want to just uh, loop this playing back. Maybe make it a little wider. That's too wide. Yeah, and that's almost like too much. Let me do more direct signal. Just to give it a little bit of space. It was a little dry maybe, all right? So I just applied that via an insert, which you don't typically insert reverb, but if you're not necessarily going to be doing anything else after that reverb, no reason not to do that. It's very real time, it functions properly. It's fine, you don't have to send everything to a bus. Um, all the time. There are cases where, yes, it's better to do that, but it's it's not something you have to do. And then, of course, um, following that, you've got, you know, some explosion. But there's also an explosion right as that text lands. And as with all things um, sound design, you have to combine. So here I have first this one here. This is Explosion Fireball Blast 1. That one's good, it's kind of dark, kind of dingy. Now, again, you can see, how is that aligned? Well, I did it just as I showed before, where I took that clip, right, grabbed it right here on this frame, and then slid this around, whoops, I'm in the wrong tool, and then slid this around based on my position here to get to the, and by the way, you know, to snap it to the exact frame that I needed to get it perfectly aligned, all right? Which is real nice. But that one sound effect wasn't enough. So again, you can even see I even doubled, I added another whoosh. So we have the fireball, but I also added this. Whoops. Add that with that fireball. Notice I also have some reverb on there. So that just kind of gives it a, a little bit of a, a little bit of tonality, right? And then as we get into the sound effects, and sorry, I gotta remute that again. Why does the music keep coming up? I don't know. Uh, let's bring in this explosion here. So you can see this one is explosion large bright. But you know, it's got all those pieces flying off and you might say to yourself, would you actually hear that? Well, in reality, no. <laughs> I mean, not unless it's hitting the ground or something and even then, probably not. But when we see it, we want to hear what that is. So here's yet another sound effect, right? Stacked together, which is explosion building demolition with debris, okay? So that one now, bring all those together, sounds like this. Right? And now it's glass and wood and all these other things. All the twinkling. Okay? So, again, sound design is all about layering. It's all about layering to get that real sort of intense kind of um, uh, punctuated sound. And then you can actually see at the end here, I went with a different one. So this one, because it, uh, let me just mute this for a sec. You can see it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a smaller explosion, right? Because just the text kind of blows away. It's not quite as big as that first one. So I just went with one sound effect here, which is explosion car debris fire. And that sounds like this.
And even though it's a smaller explosion, it's just kind of brighter. And notice the light, right? It kind of has to work visually too. It was brighter. The other ones were a bit darker and a bit bassier and boomier because it was a bigger explosion. This one is a little louder or it appears louder because it's brighter, but it kind of works with that light burst. Right, which is really cool. So if we zoom out full again, let's unsolo everything. Oh, and yeah, and then the last couple of elements here. Here, let's unmute this stuff. Um, always necessary. So um, having some weird kind of production sound in there. Because again, just an explosion is kind of boring. There's no, there's no weird tonality. So. In my head, when I saw this, it's like you kind of get that weird, like your head is swirling, you know, think weird sci-fi. So this is just a combination of two very different production ambients. This is called Production Element Title Imaging Ambient Pitch Drop. Right. And the other one here is uh, Distortion Static Random Blips. And then I've got another one here, which is Spooky Voices. And this is kind of playing through everything. And then this one is slow space title imaging. All right. Put it all together. And now we have this. Let's go full screen on it. Let's see it real nice. And all of that sound design alignment and everything, I think it took me like 15 minutes. And it took me 15 minutes because now with the clip spotting where I can see exactly where I am in the frame and exactly where it needs to go with incredible accuracy, it just made this process so, so easy. All right, super, super cool. Um, oh yeah, oh nice, Ant. Yeah, you've been using Loopology. Oh, that's great to know. That's great. Hey, thanks. Oh, <laughs> sorry, you're on a craptastic laptop speaker. Yeah, that's okay. Hey man, you know. Uh, I mean, this isn't that brilliant to begin with, but it's okay. But yeah, there's a lot of nice bass, and yeah, I mean, you can just hear all the cool elements here. It's really, really good, and these are all really well recorded. Um, while I'm at it, because we've got a last couple of minutes. Let me let me just grab that uh, grab that link for you here in the chat. Uh, okay, hold on. Grabbing it off of my blog. Which, by the way, I think I'm going to shut down my uh, my old uh, Budaju music blog. If anybody's cares, <laughs> I don't think anybody does. That's kind of why I'm shutting it down. I I don't publish there anymore and. It's a great reference, but um, it's costing a lot of money to keep it up there. And it's really old, and it was designed and ported over from like five different uh, um, blog authoring properties and tools over the years. I think it started in movable type. Anybody remember movable type? And then it went to something else, and then I eventually got it onto WordPress. And then I got it off WordPress to something else. So it's just, it's been like converted and put through the ringer so many times formatting is terrible and it looks just atrocious but um in any case click on the link that i just gave you there it gives you a link to actually go to um the lubology downloads in fact i should have just put that in there why didn't i just give you that one instead of the blog link that's okay i'll see traffic to the blog for the first time it's usually just spam uh nowadays uh anyway at the bottom of that blog article you'll see adobe audition lubology content sound effects music beds and more and uh, there's great stuff in there. It's all royalty free, so you can use it in any and all productions, as Ant mentioned. Um, it's fantastic. And uh, it's a lot. Oh, also worth pointing out, I don't know if you heard, but today, if you do a Google search, the BBC is actually now, in fact, here, let me switch my camera for a second. I'll pull this up for you. The BBC is, um, they are now, what should I say? They're giving away. Yes, they've made available to the public, um, 16,000 sounds from their incredible library. So here's the URL, in lieu of me typing it in, you can see bbcsfx.acropolis.org. 
www.ghostbusters.org.uk. And this is phenomenal. It's, it's, I mean, especially if you're someone who ever listened to any like BBC radio plays and things from the past or shoot, Beatles, anything recorded in the 60s where sound effects were used in psychedelic recordings made in England. They used sounds from these libraries. Most of these, many of these, I haven't actually seen, are of course in mono. And you can see it gives the year from a lot of these things. And then some of them will say, you know, reprocessed for stereo. Um, and I was just kind of auditioning some of these before. I mean, it's just, it's really, it's really cool. Uh, and then, you know, and you see that it's got the durations here. So you're here, animated crowd reaction. It's 284 seconds. You know. Well, this is uh, sports, wrestling, indoor. They're not so, not so animated yet. Uh, anyway, um, oh, here's, this one was cool too, yeah. Jeering, angry crowd, you know. 1972. Anyway, so this is just kind of fun. We don't have to spend any time on that, but you've got the URL now. If you're looking for more sound design elements, 16,000 from the BBC. And there's, a, there's a, 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 a license agreement thing that you read that talks about their usage and things, but it's pretty, it's pretty wide open. And what, a, what an incredible treasure trove of content to be sort of giving away to people to leverage in, I think it's, I think you can use it in educational, um, online, obviously it can't be repackaged and sold. You just have to read through the, the, uh, the license agreement before you download, but really cool that they're offering that. Okay, so the last thing I'm gonna show you here, I'm just gonna switch my screen one more time, I need to pull up a file for you, is uh, something that I've been asking for, for a really long time, which was uh, the ability to add, um, thumbnails directly to um, to mp3 files. So this was something that you simply could not do directly in Audition and it meant that you had to do it in iTunes or somewhere else. Well, now you can do it directly in Audition, thank heavens. So if we go to our metadata panel, which opened up over here. So this is uh, a track from a recent album of mine EP that you can find on Spotify, Apple Music, uh, YouTube Music as well right here, YouTube Red, YouTube, just regular YouTube. It's called Anytime by Fuzzy Island and myself. And uh, here's all the metadata, the ID3 V2 tags. Now we've always had this field of metadata and you can see we've got all these various fields of metadata that you can populate for various uses. But the new feature here is the ability to add album art directly. So let me go ahead, hold on, I don't know where this is gonna open into, so let me just go into browse, and oh yeah, there we go, that's where we need to be, okay. And we'll grab the cover of the record, which is this, all right. By the way, this will take JPEG or ping files, click open on that, and boom, there you go. And when you save it, it does not re-encode, so that's really nice. So again, just a way to add album artwork into your MP3s. Um, if you're, you know, making your own collection, I'm a total nut when it comes to having album artwork, whether it's a ripped CD, which I don't rip too many anymore or anything, even if I just, you know, create an MP3 myself, I have to put some artwork there. I can't stand seeing that default blank musical note. It drives me crazy. <laughs> so having the album artwork there is really useful and nice. And, uh, oh yeah. Ant saying movable type way back machine, dude, uh, yeah, so I'll tell you what, I don't, I don't recommend going to my site way back when, but I think the original site that I built was in 98 or 99. It's still on the Wayback Machine, and it is, man, <laughs> it's a site to be seen for sure. Uh, nothing I want to remember. I think the homepage had 16 different fonts on it, you know, if that tells you anything. Anyway, so my friends, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for joining me here on the Creative Cloud YouTube channel. Um, I'll be back in one hour on the Premiere Pro Facebook page, 3 p.m. Pacific time, Premiere Pro Facebook, talking about our new color match workflows. That'll be about 20 minutes or so. I'm getting a little tired. And uh, until then, have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much again for tuning in, and we'll see you again next time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.